Lecture one from module four, genre, the community experience. I'm going to start this lecture off with two quotations. First one, the world is a comedy to those that think, a tragedy to those that feel. Horace Walpole, the Earl of Oxford, 18th century English politician and writer. Second quote, it's okay to feel sad. From the character Sadness from the movie Inside Out. Take a second and think about what those quotations might mean. We should discuss them in class next time. So let's define our terms, right? Generally speaking, the word genre, it is how to categorize a work of art. And so you're putting like things together, particular style or form or content. When we're talking about theater and then also film, the way we're categorizing things is by the emotional response it evokes or creates in its audience. And it's this emotional response in audiences that really is foundational to theater as an art form, right? If I asked you to tell me what these symbols are here on this screen, you would tell me, oh yeah, they're comedy and tragedy masks. They're the masks of theater. And so they're kind of two sides of a coin. They're the two genres that the Greeks really invented and kind of perfected for their own culture. And much of our European and American playwriting tradition comes out of them. So you can take the same story, right? Going back to our bucket of beads and you can pick out the tragic beads or you can pick out the comic beads. And even though it's the same story, you're gonna have a different necklace because you're going to evoke a different emotional response in your audience. So this lecture, let's focus on tragedy. When I say the word tragedy, what do you think? Do you like seeing tragedies or do you avoid them? Probably most of us would say that we avoid them, that we don't like them because tragedies are quote, depressing, right? Except how many times have you seen Titanic or The Notebook or, you know, um, uh, oh, God, what was the um, Marvel Universe one with Thanos there, right? Point is, we watch tragedies. We love tragedies. We just don't know why. And so we're going to explore that now. So some common ways that people might think about tragedy, right, is that tragedy is meant to be depressing or tragedy. Oh, yeah, I know what tragedy is. That's when bad things happen to good people. Or if you were in high school and heard about the tragic flaw when you were studying, say, Hamlet, right? You'd be like, oh, yeah, I know tragedy. It's about deeply flawed characters who can't help but screw up. Or maybe you read Oedipus in high school. You'd be like, yeah, tragedy. That's all about fate where characters are just doomed from the start. Nah, I don't believe in any of that. It's important to remember that tragedy developed as an art form out of those religious rituals in ancient Greece, right? I told you about them before. And those rituals originally involved human sacrifice, right? Because when you are expressing gratitude to, you know, an omnipotent power who controls your very existence, right? In order for them to feel properly thanked, they have to receive something from you that is valuable, right? And what do you get a God who has everything? Well, the most valuable thing to you when your hold on existence is precarious, you know, is your life or the life of someone in your community, okay? Which sounds terrible and barbaric and callous and unfeeling, but, but think about this, right? We see this in the Judeo-Christian Bible, right? In, in um, the Old Testament, Abraham, the patriarch, you know, longs for a child more than anything. His wife, Sarah, loves him. They have a great marriage. She's amazing, but she's never, ever had a kid. And now she seems like she's too old to have a kid. And all of a sudden she gives birth um, and they have this beautiful baby boy. And God tells Abraham, I've given you this child because of your faith. But it's the tradition in Abraham's culture to sacrifice that first child in the hopes of then getting many more, right? And so Abraham prepares to sacrifice his son Isaac. And at the last minute, Yahweh says, that was a test, you passed, you don't have to sacrifice him, okay? So kind of the same thing going on here in ancient Greece, right? Originally involved human sacrifice. Somewhere along the way, they decided just acting out a sacrifice, a virtual sacrifice, as it were, 
right, would be just as good as a literal sacrifice. So they started sacrificing animals instead, or they wrote these plays where people endured great suffering uh, and died on the stage, but the actors didn't, right? So this was seen as a ritual community building event that was you know, necessary to the health and prosperity of the city state. And it was not only seen as important for keeping the city state, you know, with a good harvest and free from disease and, you know, safe from attack from a rival, um, but it was also viewed as a healthy, healing and necessary experience for the individual members of the audience. What the heck? Why is watching a virtual sacrifice a healing and healthy and necessary experience? Well, the theater scholar Ian Johnson says that tragedy affirms the ability of humans to push the human spirit to the limit, no matter the consequences, right? And if you think about tragedy, tragedies are always asking those big, universal, timeless questions about human existence and what it means to be human and, you know, the big why questions, okay? Tragedy asks us to think about those things, to really wrestle with them. Why are why is life unfair? Why does it hurt sometimes? Why does justice not win? Why is there suffering? Those kinds of things. Tragedy asks us to think about those things and try to come up with answers. So as I said before, Sacrifice is at the heart of Greek tragedy, it used to be literal human sacrifice when it was a straight up religious practice, became this virtual human sacrifice in the form of a play. And before you start thinking about how barbaric those ancient Greeks were, think of the Christian mass and other religious rituals, right? I've already shared the, the Jewish Old Testament story of Abram and Isaac, right? But every week, if one goes to mass, one participates in a virtual sacrifice of Jesus of Nazareth, right? And if one follows the Christian mass, people will pray saying, you know, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The sacrifice of the individual man slash God benefits the community as a whole. And so when we have this virtual sacrifice, the community is getting those benefits of the sacrifice without the literal loss of life, both in the mass and in plays, and in lots of lots of other ways played out in different cultures. So I want you to think about those two articles I had you read for class this week, the Sadness Breeds Gratitude article and the Grief Lessons, which is written by Ann Carson, who also wrote uh, the Antigone that we read. What do these two authors say about tragedies and what values might they have for us as individuals and as a society? Come to class prepared to talk about that. One thing that tragedy does to benefit us, so theorists believe, is on this very personal level, we have this catharsis, okay? Aristotle said that tragedies were designed to arouse terror and pity in the audience and to ratchet up that tension to the breaking point till we reach that catharsis and then explosively all of that releases. Why is that good? Well. Aristotle says the point of all of those mechanics was to create this sensation of catharsis, releasing that pent-up tension in an emotionally cleansing way. Sounds bizarre, right? But I'm sure you've either experienced, you know, when you've been stressed out or upset about something, you've kind of felt the tension building and bubbling in you. Sometimes you have a good cry or, you know, a scream therapy session. And even though your circumstances haven't changed, you've kind of had this like emotional reboot. And now you've kind of let it all out, and now you can go face up what you got to face, you know? Or if one is Catholic, going to a confession where you're really just, like, spitting out everything that you've done wrong and, and, and letting your guilt um, and regret um, be acknowledged and atoned for, and then you can go kind of start over with a, you know, kind of new, fresh, clean soul. Sometimes if you're stressed, you're going to engage in a physically demanding activity or exercise. You're going to go, you know, punch a, a punching bag at the gym or run really hard or, um, you know, dance until you get shin splints or something. Even something as simple as yelling at the TV during a football game or a political debate. I'm sure all of us have done this one way or another, right? The players on the other side of the TV, they cannot hear you. 
We know that, but we yell at them anyway, right? We sit on the edge of our seats and our bodies are all tensed up and we're like, you know, crushing a cup in our hand or something. And, and we're just like, ah, come on, right? It's almost like, it's almost like we're playing the game with them while we're sitting there kind of yelling and screaming and, and, and uh, you know, tensed up and, and trying to coach from our living rooms. And then if our team wins, right, isn't that explosive? People whoop and holler and stand up and dance around the room and, you know, spray champagne or toss Gatorade on people, right? It's this release. And that release is coming because we have been so tense that whole game, right? As a lifelong Red Sox fan who only started winning, you know, in the last two decades, believe me, I know what it's like <laughs> to have pity and terror aroused in me for an entire baseball game and occasionally having that big payoff, right? So point of all of this, we do this all the time in our everyday lives. The Greeks constructed their tragedies to artificially build up tension in the audience and release it so they can have the benefits of this cleanse. Because these benefits of a catharsis are both emotional and physiological. Physiological, right? When we're tense and then that tension gets released, right? Our heart rate increases. We might be holding our breath. Our blood pressure might go up a little bit. When we have that release, we might have tears. We might have yelling but we're definitely taking some deep breaths. And when we're doing this, we are physically cleansing our bloodstream of toxins in our sweat, in our tears, even in our breath when we're yelling. Some of the cortisol and stress hormones and things that we're building up in our system because we're stressed get released. And we're also exchanging, you know, big deep lungfuls of air when we sob, when we yell, all of that stuff, right? We're taking deep breaths, which means good air in. It also means forcing a lot of bad air out. And so not only do we feel better emotionally lots of times, we literally are physiologically kind of cleaner. And once we've had this emotional workout, we somehow are better equipped to handle the actual stresses at the actual levels in our own lives. And as a bonus, because we've been engaging in this empathy, right, we have kind of worked that empathy muscle and we now have the greater capacity to understand the stresses and have compassion for the stresses in other people's lives. So while all theater is a good empathy workout, tragedy in particular really, really is the, you know, high intensity interval workout of empathy. It's key. We really need to experience that pity and terror of the characters in order to have this catharsis. We cannot get to the catharsis without the empathy. So we have this you know, emotional workout that's good for us emotionally and physiologically. And then that empathy helps us to better the community around us. So when we're watching a tragedy, right? It's all about witnessing that protagonist suffering and sacrifice. And through that, where our you know, terror and pity and our stress is engaged because we're empathizing, we then experience this catharsis. And then going through that whole experience kind of makes us feel grateful for the relationships that matter to us. And so we call this like, you know, tragic beauty or tragic pleasure, which sounds like an oxymoron, but really it's this moment to kind of respect the dignity of the human condition and kind of honor the difficulty it is to be human and celebrate the courage it takes just to get up and survive the day. And so at the end of all of this, at the end of a tragedy, we tend to leave the theater feeling lighter and more positive. So it's really the opposite of depressing. So really, one thing I want you to take away from this class is that tragedies aren't meant to be depressing. Tragedies are an emotional workout for us to feel better about ourselves and to do better for each other. <laughs>